Hello my friends, it is Monday and so much happened on the weekend. See, I don't make military updates on the weekend and immediately when I try to rest on Saturday or Sunday, Zelensky is like, boom, boom, we're gonna do everything right now. What am I talking about? Well, the Ukrainian SPU, Special Forces Raid into Crimea, the Ukrainian liberation of one settlement in the Kherson area, riots in Russia and many other topics. We're gonna go through all of these one by one today and we're going to begin with the SBU raid into Crimea. This is reported by Rebar, the Russian biggest military blogger and you can always be certain these things happen when Russians are reporting Ukrainian attacks on their settlements because usually they don't want to report them because it's kind of a Russian failure if a country without a significant navy like Ukraine is able to attack Russian occupied positions in Crimea. The report states that two attackums, Americans don't want Ukrainians to use these missiles on Russian soil. Hey, but Crimea is not Russia, it is Russian occupied Ukraine. Also, in addition to the, these two attackums, three unmanned boats or drones were used. And it gets better, also a storm shadow was used. So, all the best that Ukraine has, attackums, storm shadow and unmanned boats or sea drones. All of these attacks happened in two different locations in Crimea, Cape Tarankut, this one right here in the settlement of Olenivka, and then Rebar reports that the sea drones hit Sevastopol. There are 17 Russian wounded servicemen, and the Russian anti-air regiment was struck, was attacked. Also five cars were damaged. What I really want to know if these cars are the Western cars, Mercedes, BMWs or Ladas. Because a Lada you could repair or buy again in Russia, uh, a BMW you cannot repair or buy again in Russia because they don't export there anymore. But now my friends, we'll go to the Kherson area, the Dnipro area, and there are huge changes in the Russian leadership of the army group right here. Well, first of all, there are huge issues for the Russians right here, because I'll zoom into the settlement, the settlement of Krinki on the Russian occupied side of Dnipro. There are reports coming from the Russian side actually that Ukrainian special forces liberated this settlement yesterday. Now it is a huge loss for the Russians because the Tsar ordered Ukrainians beaten out of that side of the Dnipro, but it's the opposite, Ukrainians have been able to enlarge in their bridgehead. And this is why the Tsar has reacted. How? Well, here it is. I'll read it to you. To commander of the Dnipro group of troops, Kherson region, Colonel General Oleg Makarevich was removed from his post. Colonel General Mikhail Deplinsky was appointed to command in his place. Oleg Makarevich was removed from his position based on the result of his reports to Moscow from our intelligence which brought to the high command the facts of the discrepancy between the results on the ground and the information that came through the command of the Dnipro group. Is this guy, he was sacked, he was, he was not able to push the Ukrainians back over the Dnipro and the Ukrainians even liberated another settlement, so we have a general sacked. I mean, will he fly out of the window? He hasn't done so yet. But Putin is a man with very slow hatred, very slow revenge, so give him some time, okay? Now, of course, the Russian issues in this area cannot be contributed to only one general or the leadership. It is, it is the fact that the Russian High Army Command has pulled everything valuable or anybody who can actually fight away from this area to strike Kupiansk or Avdivka. Also, Ukrainians have pounded the logistical network in the area, so Russians really have huge attrition issues here. What I can assume from that is that General was really painted as a scapegoat for every kind of issue Russians have in the area. In the Russian army, you need scapegoats every now and then to put all of the problems under one guy and throw me out of the window and you're good to go for another month and then you need another scapegoat. This is why Russian army command changes positions all the time. Look at this photo, Putin and who is this guy? Commander Deplinsky, the newly appointed commander of the Dnipro army grouping of Russia. Every, basically the leader of the entire Dnipro operation of Russia. And his goal now is to push the Ukrainians back over the river or 
He'll fly out of the window. Easy, simple. Ivan, don't complicate things. But what did this guy, the last commander who was just sacked, have to say about the new commander, the Plinsky? Well, I'll read his report to you. Ukrainian fighters, I can say one thing, hang yourselves. He's one of the most competent generals in our army. Makarovich added that the replacement was most likely due to the extreme lack of initiative of the command in this direction, ignoring the situation on the ground and sweeping what is happening under the carpet. He's, he's blaming his subordinates that they swept it under the carpet. Well, he, is the, he was the leader of the army grouping. He swept it under the carpet. The fish rots from the head. And now, my friends, where do we go? We go to Donetsk, of course, of Divka. The battle is still ongoing, and this is why Kherson region for Russia is doing so bad, because everything and everybody who can actually somewhat fight has been transferred to Avdivka to be used in these convoy meat assaults. We have new videos, new information and reports today, and, for, and I'll read you the first one, coming from the Russian side. This is Vostak Z, a Russian serviceman in the area, and he actually writes pretty truthfully. I like what I'm hearing. I like always reading where I know that these are Russian lower servicemen who have, who don't have the necessity to lie because they di they directly suffer through the Russian command structure. So here is where we get the truth. The guys from our company asked me to write this post. I am not a supporter of writing about failures and losses because this works into the hands of the Germans. Actually, the Ukrainians, for some reason, they call them Germans because for them it's like the World War II again and fighting like their grandfathers against the Nazis. Uh, don't ask me. That's, that's how they cope with stuff. But the situation is tense. So, what is a meat assault? This is any assault by infantry forces without artillery support, without suppressing enemy firing points. Why is this happening? Mostly due to the lack of means of suppression. So, the lack of artillery, the lack of air, air superiority, basically he admits that they don't have anything else or any other capability, so they use what they have, which is biomass, humans. Human life is cheap, a BTR is more expensive or the inability to properly manage the support. When two regiments attack side by side, the junction between them is practically unsecured. Everyone hopes for their neighbor, or one has tanks and artillery and the other one doesn't. But the order to take the fortification is there. This is a very great fact here that I want to elaborate on. Two regiments attack side by side. It takes an entire army command operational department to coordinate an attack of many different units that have to work together because the gaps in between of these units, they can only be fulfilled and secured as good as good is your communications, the overall understanding of the situation by the command structure. In Russia, that is non-existent. They don't know who is where, who is attacking what, and the gaps between attacking units form, and they're pretty large, and they're quite easy to exploit. It is so different in the United States military. They have people working whose entire focus is to coordinate communication and cooperation between different units. So these gaps wouldn't form and everybody would understand in the same way who is where, what is happening where. And even then there's sometimes blue on blue. In the Russian situation it's so much worse. Nobody has any idea where Ivan is. Now the situation in our sector is such that we cannot reach small arms firing distance. We are being exhausted with mortars and AGSs on the way. Our tanks start work, enemy kamikazes immediately look for them, the group's losses at the exit. This is our meat assault in the most uncomplicated form. The result is zero. And I do agree, I've seen plenty of these videos. Tanks start moving, immediately Ukrainian artillery, which has shot in rehearsed positions, and Ukrainian anti-armor kamikaze drones start hunting the Russian armor. If they, when they take out the armor, they continue with mortars to grind down the infantry. The result is absolute zero. And we are trying to come to an agreement with the neighbors. We ask them to support us when the assault starts, but we just need sensible artillery preparation. And everyone understands this. Even the Germans or the Ukrainians in our sector understand this. 
We are similar in psychotype. We stand to the end. We don't give up and we call each other Bidri in the air. That is weird because the Ukrainians call the Russians Bidri and the Russians call the Ukrainians Bidri, which is strange. There is a distant guess that all our attacks are in order to exhaust them and then the regulars will come in and finish the job with powerful blow. As long as our regiment does not finish while the regulars are marching. Now, in this last paragraph, we truly found out what the Russian tactic is really about. Meat assault is not to gain any kind of result. It is to tie up every Ukrainian firing capability. Small arms, anti-tank guided missions, guided artillery, kamikaze drones. And when they are tied up with grinding up this meat assault, the regulars or the designtniks will come in, swoop over the Ukrainian infantry positions who have shot all their ammunition or are in the reloading phase or are too busy grinding up the meat assaults. The meat assaults are only there to distract with their own bodies or with their armored vehicles for the designtniks to come in later. And we've seen this happening in Bahamut. We see this happening in Avdivka. Alexander Stupun, a spokesperson for the defense forces of the Tavria region of Ukraine, reports this. According to their intelligence, Russians have lost KIAs in Avdivka 6,500. I kid you not. That is an insanely high number for this one settlement. And it is getting there to be compared to Bahmut, which is what, 30,000 KIAs in six months? We're talking only three weeks of Avdivka and it's already... 6,500. Alexander also reports that Russians have gathered about 40,000 troops into the Avdivka region, making it the most active offensive operation of the Russian forces of occupied Ukraine. And I know you guys want footage. Well, I have footage for you. It is right here. This is the newest Russian push on Avdivka, and again with an armored convoy. But this one, I'm Surprised because I see three Digr vehicles here. Digrs are capable vehicles, but Russia doesn't have that many of them. They are MRAPs, like the United States Oshkosh, only not that great. Russians lost most of them in the first three months of war, but now we see three of them right here. Look at them. The three last vehicles are Digrs. Then we have some BMPs, track BMPs. Do we have some BTRs? No, mostly. Yes, we have some BTRs. So Digr, BMP. PTRs. As you can see, vehicles are bunched together in a road, filled to the brink with infantry. Also, another squad is on top. We're seeing here a full company load of infantry put on these 12 vehicles. Now, I cannot show you what continues in this video, but the 55th separate artillery brigade of Ukraine is having fun with these troops. They're grinding them up. I don't know if the tactic for Russians to send these meat assaults and then the something works, but I can sell, tell you this, not good for the meat assaults. All of this convoy you see in this video was knocked out cold, sent to sleep with the fishes. Gone. Liquidated. Also, Russians lost another Su-25 in the Avdivka region. See, they are trying to push in more air power, but since the air is contested, which is a loss for the Russians because they're supposed to have air superiority, these planes will be shot down. Ukrainians avoid flying close to the front lines because the Russians have the same capability of shooting down the Ukrainian planes. So, Ukrainians think and don't fly close to the front lines, but the Russians, mm, they do. Su-25, one a week, goes down in this area. And now, my friends, we will watch a Ukrainian soldier's report coming from Abdivka, translated by Dmitry. He gives us an overview, a truthful one, and I want to guide your attention to his eyes. They have seen some battles. I'd like to explain something about Abdivka. Because the info that is currently provided to our society by Ukrainian reporters and telegram channels involves repeat of Bahmut scenario in Avdivka, which we held and then left. I'd like to remind that the defense line and strong points were built in Avdivka since 2014, thus they are quite powerful. I've been always saying this, the battle around Avdivka has been going on since it's Tonetsk, it has been going on for 10 years. Ukrainians have been able to defend this strong point for 10 years they have built up their fortifications. 
There's a reason why Russians, even with 40,000 troops in the area, have not been able to push through the same locations they weren't able to push through 10 years ago. Left and right flanks and the area DAP and Spartak. But despite this, this enemy decided to assault. In all directions and all flanks. In some areas, in northern flank in particular, waste heap site, the Terricon, they have advancements but insignificant. One could say that they, the grey zone, the combat zone expanded. This is about any height taken by them. Also, I'd like to add that the enemy will not be able to bring up reserves in the direction in nearest days. It is because Ukrainian defense forces struck accumulation of enemy personnel in Donetsk. All of the uh, infantry moving to Avdivka moves through Donetsk. It's a big city and it's easy to hide inside that city away from Ukrainian artillery. So they bring them to Donetsk. But now the Ukrainians struck a Russian gathering position in Donetsk, hurting the logistics and transportation systems significantly. So in the next few days, reserves have to be stationary. Some military units of the internal troops. The waste heap height is under control of the armed forces of Ukraine. So the Derekon that the Russians planted their Soviet flag or Russian flag, it is still under the Ukrainian lip. It is under, a, under Ukrainian army control. All of the sacrifices and even the waste heap is gone for the Russians. Enemy infantry stops exciting trying to ascend it. Let's not spread panic too early and more importantly, let's not prevent AFU from doing its job by posting comments. So he's calling us to trust the armed forces of Ukraine and I see a lot of comments saying, oh, but Bahmut was lost in the end. Yes, Bahmut was. Ukraine's pulled out of Bahmut, but it cost Russians 30,000 KIA, 20,000 wounded, about 50,000 away from the army. It is not about keeping the ground under any cost. It is about inflicting as much losses to the enemy as possible. And this is why I trust armed forces of Ukraine, because I see the tactic, saving your own manpower, inflicting as many losses to the Russians as possible while saving your manpower. I like this tactic and I stand by it. But now, my friends, there's another topic I didn't mention before. There are riots going on in Russia. What? It wasn't even... Mobilization wasn't even declared yet. Already riots. And when I say it to you, it's scary. They are anti-Semitic. I'm not kidding you. They're pogroms against Jewish people. This footage comes from Makachkala Airport, where rioters... It, it is in Dagestan, one of the only Muslim regions in Russia with Chechnya. People in that city got rumors that there are refugees coming from Israel, Jewish refugees coming from Israel to Dagestan, and they were flamed with rage. I mean, this is Russia. It's a very anti-Semitic land, politically, I mean. Not particularly the people, but the political system is anti-Semitic. And all of these videos, countless videos, show much Makachkala people, who are primarily Muslim, go to the airport, storm the whole airport, loot the airport, and actually start attacking people coming out of the planes because they think they're Jewish refugees. This is real happening in Russia right now. It reminds me of the glass night in Germany before Second World War. Kristallnacht, they call it. Crystal night, the night of the broken windows. The same thing is happening in Dagestan, Russia right now. Now there is a claim online. I'm not saying I agree with it, but there are rumors that this is ignited by the Russian FSB because on these photos you can see that Russian house in Israel. So the Russian representative building in Israel is calling for people in Israel to move to Russia. And where? To Dagestan. Why Dagestan? They could say move to Moscow, move to St. Petersburg. They're saying move to Dagestan, one of the most Muslim areas in Russia. They're inviting people from Israel to Dagestan. Well, why could this be? Because perhaps the FSB wants to ignite something against the Jewish people. Now, I'm not saying this is true. I'm saying this is what is rumored. 
The Russian riot police Omon was deployed and the Dagestani government stated that they will watch the security footage one by one, analyze everybody's faces and put everybody the justice that took part in this riot. But you cannot take these words really seriously because Russians always say this, but if this raid was inflicted by the FSB, of course, nothing will happen to the riot eaters. Perhaps they even got paid for it. It is an anti-Jewish raid. And now, my friends, we go to Israel because things are changing fast there. The Israeli mobilization has finished and hundreds of thousands of mobilized uh, conscripts have been called up. And Netanyahu actually stated that the armed forces of Israel have moved into the G area. I cannot say the name, can you believe it? But I can't. But you know what strip I'm talking about, the G strip. Physically, Israeli armed forces have moved into it. It started with special forces and now the army is conducting regular raids and the IDF flag has been planted two clicks into the G strip. The situation is very tense, battles are going on. And recently, Russia Putin asked the H group, you know the group residing in the G Strip, Putin asked them to release eight hostages who have the Russian citizenship. If this goes through, then Russia can demonstrate themselves as having power with the H group, which gives them more push and gravity in the Middle Eastern diplomatic process. Time will show if the H group will respond to this. My friends, and now the best part of the video, I want to thank the Patreons who are supporting this channel. And some of these names are new, some of them are old, but they're all tier 10 and above. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Göran Haldström, Olena Bengtsson, Rovan Haik, Andrev Forbes, Andrius Stankevikius. This is that... Um, Latvia, Lithuania, I have no idea. Since it has S on the both name, I'm thinking you're the Baltic. Thank you, my friends. And if you like my channel, check out my Patreon. Also, check out my Instagram for cool footage I cannot post on YouTube. Go and follow. I'll see you there. Until my next update, my friends, which will be tomorrow. Slava Ukraine and bye-bye.